Jenny Hudson bringing you The Author Connection, the voice of independent authors. And today I am very excited to have Robert Dove McClellan, author of the up and coming cookbook, A Dance in the Kitchen. And Robert is a chef and he is also a singer and a religious historian and a poet. And he's got some great anecdotes and recipes and all kinds of delightful things to talk about. I am delighted to have you. Thank you. So um, your new cookbook, A Dance in the Kitchen, is just about hot off the press. And I love the title, which conveys joy. And it is a joyous book. So it's actually more than a great cookbook. Um, what makes your book different? Tell us. Well, I was thinking about this a lot because as a publisher, you have asked me this question many times. So it's promoted me to think, OK, what's the really big difference? Uh, obviously, it has recipes. That's not different. What's different, I think, I hope, is that my experience with people is that most of them are very intimidated uh, when it comes to cooking because they think it's something only experts can do. And I'm hoping that this book is joyous enough and empowering enough that people will be inspired and less afraid to try stuff on their own. Um, you will... We may, we may mention this later, but all this was done in a galley kitchen. I, I measured it the other day, including the cabinets and the refrigerator and the pantry closet. It's nine by nine feet. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, which means there's about 27 square feet of actually moving around space. So if that can be done there, it can be done anywhere. And I'm hoping people will pick that up. So that... Going back to the size of the kitchen, that's sort of an interesting point because I think that you were not alone in that kitchen when you were creating the recipes, right? And I was so, not alone in that kitchen. So tell me about <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, this goes into our collaborators, as I call them. Um, some years ago, now three years, I guess, um, a friend of mine approached me one day while on a beach, at a beach party. And she said her son was bored with junior high school and wanted to be homeschooled, and one of the things he wanted to know was how to cook. And after a lot of um, back and forth and an interview with him, to make sure it was his idea, uh, I took him on for a year. And so for a year, once a week, for four or five hours, he would show up, and we would work together in this galley kitchen. Which meant you had to say, every time you wanted to go past someone, excuse me, take a step to the left, please, or some such direction, otherwise you would collide. So it really was a dance in the kitchen. It really was, and when that <laughs> was finished, it turned out he had a friend who had been, I guess I, you'd say, envious of this the whole time, and, and really wanted to do something like that as well. So the next year I took on Rowan. Uh, the first kid's name was Julian, and then Rowan, and together the three of us have, in fact, tested every single recipe in this cookbook, in this little galley kitchen by dancing with each other, but more than just a dance, or, or maybe because dance is always cooperative, just like cooking was in this case, we had to learn how to anticipate each other. My favorite time was when I went to move to the garbage can uh, and found that Julian had seen me make that move and had put his foot down on the pedal so that by the time I actually got there, the lid was open. <laughs> And I thought, and without a word being spoken. That is like dancing. It really is. That's and great. So that has been tremendous fun. So and, speaking and of dancing, story. that just reminds me, don't you have a music playlist in your cookbook as well? That you I use? do, I do. I, I was actually, um, I, I, you know, I like to try things out before I say to people, oh, this would be fun. So the other day I was making something for a potluck party. And I decided to put on one of those uh, recordings, which is Acoustic Africa. Um, and the other one that I did that time was called Los Maspachas, which is a group of kids who went to Peru uh, and learned how to play that kind of music. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was just really cool stuff. Um, and to really see, you know, what's that like dancing to that actual music while you cook? Because um, you can have it in your head. But hearing it is something special. Yeah, and it probably gave you a little extra soul to put into the food. Exactly, exactly what it is. And I think that's especially true when you're doing it by yourself. When you're cooking with another person, there's a different kind of dance going on. 
But alone in the kitchen, it can feel like a task instead of a joy. So speaking of the food, what kind of recipes are we going to find in this book? Well, I guess there's two important things to say about that. The first is all these recipes are vegetarian. Some of them are what is called vegan, meaning no dairy products or eggs or anything. But there's a section at the end of the book which explains how you can substitute to get there if that recipe does have those things which you don't want. But apart from that little caveat of being vegetarian cooking, what I wanted to introduce people to was something that for the last 30 years or so has been called fusion cooking, uh, which is combining uh, ideas and ingredients from the various traditions and cultures of the world into new recipes. Uh, one of the inspirations for that came, uh, a friend of mine was in Los Angeles and got a taco at one of those truck stops. And the taco had kimchi in it, which is this Korean pickled vegetable. And they were surprised, but then I realized, well, Central America has a lot of history of pickled vegetables, so this would go very well, but with a different kind of flavor. Oh, that's and so I like to mess around with that stuff myself. And so I wanted to introduce the idea of fusion cooking, which of course not only includes within any one given recipe, but a meal where you have different dishes from different countries, um, which go together, even though they aren't from the same culture. Oh, that's great. So the cookbook actually will have a whole meal that you can put out. The cookbook doesn't have the meal, but it is on my website. Oh, great. There's going to be a meal for every month. I love that. So what is your favorite story from developing the book, besides the trash can story? Right. Well, apart from the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the homeschooling cooking lessons, which I had to develop because this is one-on-one -on -one teaching, and that's very different than doing a classroom, um, and trying to figure out what does this child know and what will he need to learn and everything else. Um, I think, for me, what happens next is, is kind of a favorite story. Um, having done all of that, I put it in a file, the curriculum and all the things that happened. Um, but the last thing that happened with that curriculum was I decided Julian had done so well that I wanted to throw a graduation party for him. And uh, I said to him, I'll take care of everything. You just need to show up and be prepared to talk for five minutes, which is a challenge if you're 13 years old. Um, and he said, you mean you're going to cook the food? And I said, yes. He said, looking kind of plaintive at me, um, can't I help? Oh. He was with me an entire day and into the evening as well. He really put energy into that and I thought he actually wants to do this now. Yes. That told me more about the success of that whole year than anything else. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. So, so Robert, you've got a long history of cooking, so talk about your experience there. I mean, you, you sure. bring a lot to, you know, your students <laughs> in your book. Okay, let's see. We have to go back probably to uh, about 1957. <laughs> oh my. Uh, like all high school kids, I needed a summer job. Uh, and I got a job in a drive-in hamburger stand next to a drive-in movie theater. And there I learned all about, you know, what happens when you grill onions all day long and the onion smell gets in your hair. And how do you get rid of that? Well, it turns out tomato juice, which works for skunks, works for fried onions, too. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Watch keep that in mind. Tomato juice, you know. Um, it wasn't too long after that. I was in college, and again, the summer job thing happened, and a friend in college had, had just had a job that summer uh, at a restaurant in Ocean City, New Jersey, named Watson's Restaurant, and that was a full-blown restaurant. That was like dinners, you know, they told me, and it turned out to be true, that, you know, they had 1,500 people every night for dinner. And I started out working in what was called the pantry. <clears throat> uh, that's the appetizers, the salads, and the desserts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the next year, I was promoted to be in charge of the pantry. 
So suddenly I was having conversations with the manager and the baker and everything else under the sun and actually managing what was going to happen with a staff of six people so working under me, as they say. Uh, I never thought of it quite like that. I always thought we were a team. But that was my sort of big introduction into large quantity cooking uh, off a menu um, and learning what people did not know. Uh, I, a lot of these people in the kitchen were also summer college kids. And I remember the day when I said to one young woman, so we're making blue cheese dressing, so I would like you to cut up this five pound wheel of blue cheese. And I went off to do something else and I came back and found her looking extremely upset and disconcerted and looked at what the board was on her board and she was trying to pick out all the little blue parts of the cheese because she felt that had gone bad. <laughs> I was kind of like, okay, how do I tell her that this is the good stuff and not laugh? Because it was a gen she was genuinely perplexed. Oh, that's a great story. And, uh, or the hot water and soap to wash the lettuce, which was a different person. So what about your experience in Philadelphia? Yeah, so uh, at one point I was living in Philadelphia, uh, part of a group called Movement for a New Society, uh, which was involved in international social change issues. Um, Nonviolent direct action social change. Training people all over the world how to do that. <clears throat> and again, one needs a job. Um, and myself and a group of people formed a collective which ran a small restaurant. <clears throat> uh, at one point, we divvied up the tasks, uh, which left me actually in charge of the menu planning. Um, that was an exciting time. Um, we did both breakfasts and lunches, and we did catering on the side. And it really was a collective operation. You, we met every week to evaluate the food we'd made, to you know, talk about how customers reacted, um, what did the stuff cost, was it too hard to make, you shouldn't do it again because it takes too long, uh, which is everything a restaurant has to analyze. Uh, when you're cooking at home, you can kind of say, well, I'm going to spend tomorrow doing X. But in a restaurant, things have to be efficient. So I learned a little bit about how to evaluate things in terms of time, as well as the result. Uh, and the cost of ingredients, of course, because somebody else was being the treasurer and was going like, but, 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 but. <laughs> um, that was in Philadelphia. Important lessons. I, I continued that catering tradition when I moved to Boston, um, but not as much, because I had a different job. And that was working with the American Friends Service Committee and doing more social change stuff directly. But you carried all of your love for food through. And how did you get the idea of writing this cookbook? Well, 10 years ago, uh, I wrote a first cookbook. Uh, and it was simply called The Cooking Book. Because it was not a recipe book primarily, but simply about how to cook what you need to know how to cook, what kinds of things go together, uh, what techniques do you need to practice. Um, and I had a thousand copies of it printed and sold about seven or eight hundred of them, and by word of mouth. That's amazing. Um, and no sooner had that come out than people were giving me suggestions about another, a sequel. And I would write them on little slips of paper and put it in a file in my drawer and, and not think about it because there were so many other things going on. And when I went to put the file for Julian's homeschool cooking lessons into that file, I pulled it out and looked at it again and said, hmm, what does this mean? Should I be doing something? Is it time now to actually pull this idea out of a drawer and make it come to life? So I asked Julian if he'd be willing to help. And he said yes. And then I got Rowan, and there we went. And what an amazing experience for those kids. I mean, really, if you talk about a homeschool experience, you just right. that would be hard to top. That's amazing. It was pretty amazing for me, too. And I think that's the most important thing. Because both of these kids really did bring something to it. Uh, I was doing stuff I'd never done before. Julian's from Cambodia originally. Um, and he'd gone back to Cambodia right as a visit for the first time since he was born in the midst of all his cooking. And when he came back, of course, I thought, well, we should try to cook some Cambodian food. 
Little did I know that, like the rest of the world, the young Cambodians were more interested in eating American food than they were in eating traditional food. Oh. But, but we made some interesting and a couple of disastrous attempts uh, till we figured out that we didn't understand the ingredients and had to rework it. So, you so learned, I learned as well. Yeah, you learned a lot. So, Robert, what have I forgotten to ask that you would like to talk about? Oh, my. Well, let's see. I think maybe the most important thing here is that I want cooking to be fun. It can be so grim for people uh, because they're terrified, because they'll be judged. Uh, and I always say, you know, if we could have access to Shakespeare's wastebasket, we would see all the stuff that didn't get published. Assume that the first time you make something, you may eat it yourself, but not want to share it with your friends. But that's how you learn. It's not a failure. It's an opportunity. And I know that sounds really like New Age pablum sometimes, but it's true. Um, and sometimes you can do a part of a recipe. I'll just share something. Uh, it didn't get into the cookbook because I was still working on it. Uh, but it's going to be on the website because... I did something just yesterday. Um, it's a dessert. And I made it partially to share with friends and see. Not knowing what it was going to turn out to be, I took a chance. I had people asking me for the recipe. So I guess it's a success. But you don't know whether it will work or not till you do it. And what was the recipe so people can look for it? It is uh, a recipe for coconut rice pudding with mangoes and candied cashews. Oh my, that sounds <laughs> wonderful. No, that sounds really nice. Well, there's a classic dish that does this, but it's very complicated because they take sushi rice and steam it, and you have to have all sorts of sort of apparatus to pull this off. And I just simply took arborio rice, the kind you make risotto with, uh, and put coconut milk in a pan and heated it up and added the rice and just stood there and stirred it gently for 20 minutes until it was all fluff and plump and absolutely delicious. You're making me hungry. <laughs> Good, so, because that's what I hope happens. Yeah, so um, on that note, where are people going to be able to find your recipes and your book and more about you? Absolutely. So the address is very simple. I like simple website addresses. Some of them get really bizarre. This is simply fusionworld.com great hyphen um, in between yeah and the book is um, going to be on okay. Amazon as well and, and um, on Barnes and Noble uh, and I believe uh, it's going to be available in Kindle as well as in paper that's right um, so I'm very excited uh, final production is soon Come yeah on. yeah the book should be out by the beginning of June so you know depending on when um, the viewers see this, um, they can look for it. And uh, anyway, Robert, you have been a very wonderful guest, and I want to thank you for being on The Author Connection. Um, and I hope everybody reads your book because it's a terrific book, and I know firsthand what a good cook you are. Um, <laughs> so, thank anyway. You for um, inviting me, and thank you for being such an encouraging publisher. You're very welcome. Um, thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.